Um, so I want to talk about open source every day. Um, it really goes without saying, especially to this community, uh, open source is really important. It allows us to spend the time focusing on the really important bits of our application, um, building on these amazing foundations. And I really can't think of any large-scale application that I've built recently that c doesn't use about half of this stack. So open source is really important. And if you don't build on these foundations, you're really, really likely to fail, uh, because they're awesome. Um, so that's why I've been doing open source for 152 days and counting, partly to give back and partly as kind of um, a process for me to learn lots of new things very quickly. Uh, learning new things such as hardware. Hardware is really fun because it allows you to yield really cool results with actually very little effort. Um, and also building some really useless shit as well because the world needs a Euro lengthener. You can thank me later. <laughs> Um, and prior to this, I wasn't really doing any open source whatsoever. Uh, and that was mostly due, due to this project, Conduct.io. It was around the time that I was starting to learn AngularJS and Ruby on Rails. And I wanted to get really good at it. So um, I banned myself from working on any other projects in my spare time. But this, uh, this project really suffered from a ship it failure. Um, it was never quite ready, the, 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 the <laughs> mobile version or the API. Um, it, it, and the documentation just weren't, weren't ready, and I was a bit too precious about it, and never shipped it. 18 months go by. Um, I've not worked on any other project. I'm just feeling incredibly demotivated. Um, but eventually, the cycle was finally broken when I released uh, Kevlar, this little project that I spent an hour building, and tens of thousands of people used it. And this got me excited again. Um, I built another thing that I wanted to build for myself for the uh, JavaScript group that I run, which is a polling system, real-time polling system. And I released this, and hundreds of thousands of people started using it. I got excited again. Um, even a French university used it to run their student elections, which was just amazing. Um, so I decided I'm going to open source like everything. So I'm going back through my old hard drives and finding old tools that I built and things like that, and just putting everything that I've ever built up. Um, and this taught me quite a number of things. So one of those things is to ship early. Uh, this is the first version of Kevlar, and the mobile experience on the left was really sucky, the first version. Um, but it's not nearly as sucky as the one on the right. Um, <laughs> you know, no website whatsoever. So ship early, ship often. And I wish I shipped early with Conduct, because on day 18, I decided, that, oh, I'll just put that live as it is, because, you know, new attitude, I'll just go for it. Um, and it's something I spent 18 months on, and nobody uses it. I don't even use it. <laughs> um, so nobody cares. And um, this, GIF, um, this GIF really has nothing to do with the talk, but I think you'll agree it's awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> So lessons learned. Working on other people's projects exposes you to new processes and different opinions. So uh, I worked on 24 pull requests uh, during this time. And uh, in doing so, I learned that Hamel was fucking awesome, despite what all my colleagues had told me. Um, so yeah, that's brilliant. Um, don't be afraid to give stuff away. Not everyone wants to steal your ideas. I have time for new projects. Um, because everything's open source, if somebody wants it to scale to a billion users, go fork it like I care. Um, so I have time to focus on new stuff that actually interests me um, because I don't need to maintain the bits as much. Now nobody is ever going to use my work ever again. Um, <laughs> and I have less time for other things. So uh, doing open source every, di every day is quite difficult because uh, I have to find the time for it and writing and uh, doing events and things like that. I have less time to do that. So that's a negative. I've been Adam Butler. Thank you very much. And yeah. Sweet, yeah, I've actually just raised my Twitter handle from this slide, which is really annoying. Um, but my name's Claire. Um, my Twitter handle is Citation, which is the word citation with a K, because Ks are cool. Um, and I work for a company called uh, Yumi in Sheffield. Um, we're a digital agency that mostly deals with kind of charities, um, especially kind of mental health charities and young persons charities. Um, as part of this, I've been really thinking about data and what we ask users to give us. Um, and a lot of this data is really sensitive. And something that's quite close to kind of my heart and my interest is how do we ask people what their gender is? This is really complicated. Um, 
this is kind of complicated because not everyone fits into the male female box. So this is kind of half, hey guys, forms are a bit weird. And this is also kind of, let's learn about non-binary agenda in uh, less than four minutes, 20 seconds, which will be great. So between one and 5% of the UK population identifies as having some form of gender variance. Um, this can be kind of intersex people, this is people who have kind of a chromosomal or a physical abnormality is not really the right word. It's, it's people who kind of don't fit into what we consider to be like the male body or the female body. Um, there are people who are transgender and these are people who are transitioning between one gender and another. Um, and these are also people who, and growing number of people who identify as non-binary, these are people who identify as a third gender or as having no gender or as being a mix of the other genders. So this is a really difficult concept, I know, and it's awful for a lightning talk, but there we go. Um, but it's also really hard information to get because it's very personal. But how do you let people who don't identify with a male-female checkbox uh, use your website in a way that's comfortable for them and is important for them? So the main issues these people will face are privacy is a massive issue. Uh, a lot of kind of trans people, a lot of LGBT people will be in, will be in multiple identities at once. They may be out to uh, their friends, but not out to an employer. Um, Google Hangouts recently, when that, ch when that changed to Hangouts from SMS, outed a load of trans people because it merged all their Google accounts together. Um, there's a lack of official identification. You have to be male or female on a British passport currently. Um, there's a, the, te the terminology is varying. I don't know if any of you guys have ever tried to look this stuff up. There's a lot of words. There's a lot of very complicated words. And there's a lot of kind of insular words that kind of belong to this community that you probably don't understand. And it's really easy to kind of give offense accidentally. Um, and you need to be aware that users will need to change information often with this whole kind of multiple identity thing. People will be moving from one identity to another. Uh, they won't have official identification because that either doesn't exist or is very difficult to come by and requires a lot of kind of you know, money and time and effort. So you kind of need to be aware of these things. So I gave this talk at a UX conference and I had to explain to them I'm not a designer, uh, to which they all laughed. And that explains like the balsamic diagram rather than drawing like anything nice in HTML. Um, so the first thing is to be really obvious about privacy. This matters to every single person with any piece of data that they give you. But for things like this, it's also very important because it's very sensitive data. So always kind of say, this field is kind of going to be visible or it's not going to be visible or et cetera. Don't use titles as a workaround. This really irritates me um, because people go like, oh, we can't ask them if they're male or female. That's kind of rude. So what we'll do is we'll ask them if they're Mr. or Miss. Aha, I've solved that problem. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> A lot of people use doctor on a form to get around that. I have seen forms with doctor male and doctor female as separate fields. Especially do not do this. <laughs> um, there is a gender neutral title if you have to ask for a title. You don't legally have to have a title, that's besides the point. But there's MX, pronounced mix, and that is a gender neutral title that's accepted by the DVLA, it's accepted by the passport office, and it's accepted by kind of banks and utility companies, all that kind of thing. Uh, the third thing is to really ask about what you care about, right? Do you really care about their gender or do you care about, um, do you care about their pronouns? Ask them about their pronouns. Do you care about physical, uh, physical attributes? Do you care about their body shape? Uh, do you care about uh, whether they are going to have, have children or not, whether they're going to give birth or not, that kind of thing? Ask about those things. Make it really easy to change information. But how do you, if you have to ask about gender because like a high rep has said all the marketers really care about gender, right? And we have to ask is how else are we gonna know if they like Barbies or Hot Wheels, right? <laughs> um, so, if you, so if you have to ask, I mean, three text fields are the way. Um, I've got a blog called Asking About Gender in which I'm collecting examples of really good uh, ways to ask about gender. So a way a lot of places, people are doing this now is you have this big list of options, you see Facebook in the bottom corner, okay, Cupid. It's a bit crap at this resolution, I apologize. But kind of having a three text field or letting people pick from multiple options, oh God, I'm running out of time so fast, um, is really good. Because you've got these, so you can still kind of say, oh, we've got like, we don't have two options, we've gone to like 30 options or whatever, but that's fine, you can still do stuff like that. If you want more information about this, take a photograph of this slide, because uh, these links are really good. Um, but these are kind of organizations that deal with other organizations talking about gender, non-binary gender, and how best to kind of work with these people and take information from them. Uh, thank you very much. So I've been doing a lot of open source projects on my own. So I have three of them here, which I'm going to have to go through uh, at speed, because five minutes isn't four minutes and a half is not so much. OK. So you just, the best thing is you just read this. The first one is an e-commerce engine. Does all your normal e-commerce stuff. Uh, it's on, on GitHub. It's very small. I used to use uh, Spree for six years, if anyone knows that. It's much smaller. One can actually understand it. 
and it's uh, made for Europeans. It has VAT built in. <laughs> Uh, it's an organization, so anyone can do extensions easy. It's a website. I've even written user and development guides. There's tests, and um, my wife's using it in her shop for a year. It's pretty stable, so go and check it out if you like. So then um, uh, I was very encouraged how fast that went, this uh, own e-commerce thing. <laughs> so, I went ahead and did um, what I've always been thinking about is a Ruby virtual or virtual machine. And specifically, I've been wondering why are those not, why don't they compile the code and why don't they use Ruby? No? We all hear, we all think Ruby is the better language, but nobody seems to have been using, seems to be using it for uh, a virtual machine yet. So I've started. The reason, of course, is that C folks sort of own this compilation thing, and it's supposed to be really difficult. So I picked up some uh, gem and cleaned it up a bit, tested it. it. Took me four weeks to get a hello out of it. No C code whatsoever involved. Um, uh, also, parsing is supposed to be very difficult. Ruby parsing um, probably is if you do it like 100%. But if you don't, then it's sort of not so difficult either, <laughs> and it, it's understandable actually. Uh, what is difficult is Ruby. Ruby is actually quite complicated. You always sort of, if you think about what send or what blocks are, it's, uh, I'm always getting confused about what is with compile and runtime. So I've started, I've written a book. Well, I'm in the middle of it. It's the basic. Uh, I can I can do I can do executables by now. I've got an architecture virtual machine, a register virtual machine, uh, ARM assembly code, got some tests. Uh, but it's definitely a work in progress. And if anyone's interested in virtual machines, uh, we're very welcome to join. And the third one is uh, I picked up sort of by accident <laughs> is, a, is a wiki, which I was supposed to start with, with supposed to do with Florian, who has uh, maintained Gollum Rails for a number of years, uh, and but he's dropped out now. So I'm on my own, which I don't really want to be. Anyone? So, how oh, quick then? One and a half minutes. Wow, that's <laughs> helps not reading them. So yeah, just to go through them again. There's this. E <laughs> oh no, no questions. Questions better. So no questions. Uh, I've got a confession to make. This has nothing to do with Ruby whatsoever. I, for, for years and years, I've had a, a, an interest in just generally how the internet works uh, and sort of learning. I spent the formative years reading RFCs because otherwise it involved talking to girls and that sort of stuff that just frightened me. So I'll just thought I'd give you a, a, a brief overview of the domain name system, how it works. Famous quote, there are only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. DNS involves both, heavily. So this is just um, taking us through uh, a bit uh, how a DNS request works. Uh, we have my laptop on the left hand side here. Uh, we're, looking to, we're looking to make a web request to, to my home page, the was.name. Uh, so first of all, the, the laptop checks to see if it's got uh, an entry in its, its own sort of local static list of, of host names. Uh, that's stored in its of hosts in most systems. Uh, if it doesn't find something there, it'll check to see if there's something in its local cache, uh, which is um, stored in, uh, in memory and managed by the C library. Uh, so it's available to all applications usually. Uh, if it doesn't have the, the answer there that it can answer immediately, then it sends out a request to um, a local DNS server. This will usually be configured automatically via DHCP or something like that, but it picks up the IP address of a name server it can talk to. Uh, usually in your home network, this will be the router sitting uh, at the edge of your home network. 
Uh, in my case here, I'm using Google's public DNS, so it's making a, a request straight out to the internet to 8.8.8.8. .8 and so Google's DNS uh, looks to see if it has an, uh, an answer to the question already in its own cache. And DNS is, is, can be ridiculously fast because it often does have the answer to these questions and it can just answer straight away. However, in this case, let's say it doesn't. Uh, what it's then going to do is it'll either talk to, to its peer DNS server, which will be an, a, another one close by, uh, or let's assume that it's, it's talking directly to uh, the well-known set of root servers. Now, every copy of um, Bind, which is the, the internet name service daemon, uh, there are a few, but Bind is the most popular one, uh, comes prepackaged with a list of root servers. There are 13 of them, and the IP addresses for these root servers. This is kind of the way you, you bootstrap the domain name system. Uh, and so it picks one of these root servers at random. Let's pick c.rootservers.net. Uh, and it sends off this request to say, What's the record for, for was.name? Now, the root DNS servers couldn't store all of the information for all of DNS everywhere. Uh, the, the sheer number of entries is just I incredible. Uh, so what it does instead is it's authoritative for the root zone, uh, which means that it knows all of the DNS servers that you could go and talk to for each of the top level domains. So .com, .net, .org, .name. Uh, so it can't answer the question directly, but it can say, listen, for the .name domain, go talk to this set of servers. And for a bonus point, I, I'm going to give you the IP address of these servers as well, just because that will be helpful and that will shortcut your next step. And so it sends back saying, uh, for the .name domains, you want to be going, talking to g6.nsltd.com. And so Google's DNS uh, um, thing, uh, looks to see if it's got the answer. Oh, shit, I've only got 50 seconds left. <laughs> right, so uh, Google's DNS goes, uh, right, that's not the answer to the question. Uh, I'm going to talk to um, g6.ltd.com, ask it the same, same question. It's going to reply saying, I don't know the answer either, but I know the was.name domain is served by cloudflare.com, uh, so go and ask them instead. Uh, so the Google DNS server goes, okay, right, let's ask cloudflare.com. At last, we've got somebody who's authoritative for the was.name domain. And so it returns back the IP address, Google's DNS server caches that for the next person to ask, and it returns it back to the laptop. And that's it. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am Francesco Canessa. I work for Quill Content. I'm going to talk to you about next-gen payment systems. But what are these next-gen payment systems? Am I going to talk about uh, Apple Pay, like you can pay with your finger, or no, Google Wallet, uh, no NFC, something, NFC, no, no. <laughs> PayPal, credit cards, yeah, like 70s systems, maybe? No. Bitcoin, no. Yes, Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> Why Bitcoin is better? It's not the uh, 70s. It's new technology, so you, your stack uh, will not talk to, I don't know, Cobol or Fortran code. Hopefully. No. Uh, and it's a push system versus a uh, pull system. So uh, basically, yeah, I'm going to talk also about the microtransaction and uh, the reference client. So why push versus, no. Uh, it's a push system, not a pull system. So basically, you have to authorize uh, the transaction with your private key because it, it's, uh, it's based on public key cryptography, public key, uh, like asymmetric cryptography. So there is a key pair, public and private, and you sign your like, transaction when you want to send money with your uh, private key. And uh, the, that's why it's a push system and not like, it's like WebSocket versus long polling, almost. But yeah, I don't have time, unfortunately, to explain everything. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about why it's good uh, for microtransactions. 
I choose uh, this, these three are my favorite. Uh, of course, there are tons of uh, why Bitcoin is better, but yeah. Micropayments or microtransactions, because uh, there are no transaction fee, or at least the transaction fees are very, very small. So uh, in normal uh, credit card transaction, uh, you have a like, fixed fee that is 20p. That's uh, why you, when you go to a shop and you say, can I pay with credit card uh, this uh, no, ice cream? They say, no, minimum is five pounds, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, uh, this is the uh, current value. Bit Bitcoin is not very useful as a currency, so there are millibits, that is uh, one thousandth of uh, Bitcoin, and right now it's 20p. Uh, so one pound is five millibits, but we don't care about the price because Bitcoin is an awesome piece of technology and we are programmers. We don't give uh, nothing about the <laughs> technology, not about the, sorry, the price. Uh, we want to develop things because uh, the world needs us. I mean, we are programmers, we are powerful and uh, we can program now money, like directly. Uh, Bitcoin is a server. Uh, like you don't have really a client server system like in every like PayPal has its, its own servers or I don't know uh, credit card like Visa and MasterCard have uh, their own servers and you talk through an API no uh, this is a uh, like full system where every server is a node so I have uh, only one minute and I will introduce you to Bitcoin D, that is the Bitcoin D one. You have to download it via bitcoin.org and it's a reference client, so it's the main open source project around the Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, there is a configuration where you can set the user password and uh, this, uh, if, if you are on a laptop, uh, because now the block blockchain is very big, so you have to use these settings. And it, you can use it via raw JSON, Bitcoin CLI, and uh, you can check my presentation because I don't have time. There are, there are uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, things, like you can ask for the balance, uh, you can ask for accounts, and the main account is the string, empty string account, but you can create a uh, name one. Then help list uh, comments, uh, and then uh, this is an address, uh, and uh, there is a dump private key command that gives the private key, then the send, uh, and that's it. This by Bitcoin. <laughs> This is Mastering Bitcoin from O'Reilly, written by Andres Antonopoulos. And I have uh, 3D printed uh, some uh, Bitcoin tags that I'm gonna throw you, so watch out. <laughs> <laughs>